Thanks very much for working me in, and I appreciate and I hope you make it worth your time. We've had a lot of sound bites about biochar, and I'm going to attempt to very rapidly put it in perspective. It is a unique material that has been around forever. Okay, I'll do that standard learning curve with the buttons. The learning curve with the buttons. Should this be like... There you go. So, what is unique about biochar? The first and really overwhelming property is that when you put it in the soil, it stays. Now, we're looking at a very short time frame here, five years, but if, you know, the leaves that drop in the fall are rotted and disappeared by the spring. And virtually all biomass, even a tree falling in the forest, is going to degrade within an, a decade or two. In biochar, we do something, and I'll talk about that, pyrolysis, and we convert about half the carbon atoms to a new form. And it has this magic property of being resistant to biological decay, which means that this line is flatter after a couple of years and continues out forever. I'll put several thousand to uh, up to a million years. It turns out it does end at a million years, but that's for this afternoon's talk because it gets real, real nerdy then. So this is a huge property. This means I can do something to the soil, and it'll still be there year after year after year. It, it, it takes the maintenance issue out of it, and that's very important. So let's look back at what happens in the absence of this change. Virtually all carbon, as we know, tends to cycle from the atmosphere to living tissues, which upon death, end of its life, the leaves falling, the trees falling down, whatever, then get recycled back due to microbial degradation in the soil, and unfortunately, all the carbon goes back up. Why does this happen? Well, we know this happens. If it didn't happen, over 600 million years, we'd be a mile deep in some residue that accumulated very, very slowly. So it all goes back. Mother Nature recycles everything. So it's great. We've got a way of capturing carbon, we've got a way of putting it in the soil, and we've got a way of watching it go back up. And if I do the math, what I see is of 200 CO2 atoms coming out of the atmosphere, the tree uses about 100 of them for ongoing metabolic requirements to feed itself. And it sends the other 100 carbon atoms, half of them, down into the soil. And that's the sugars that are used to work with the microbes and develop soil carbons, et cetera. But they are eating them and sending them back up. Now, a very important bullet at the end there is if we put NPK out there for the plant, it doesn't seem to think it needs to feed those microbes to get the NPK, and it doesn't. And what happens is the microbes eat each other, and that's what decimates soil carbon. Synthetic fertilizers, artificial sources of plant fertilizers, convince the plant, I'm not going to waste my precious sugars on these microbes. I don't need them anymore. I'll grow more plant. I'll make more corn. So Monsanto sells a fertilizer and gets more corn yield. But the microbes in the soil disappear. So now let's change the equation. Let's intervene at the end of the biomass life. I'm not telling you to go out and kill biomass. I'm saying go rake your leaves or catch it upon it dying. We do this step called pyrolysis. This is where you heat it up. And what happens is half those carbon atoms, 25%, get released as energy. It's about 70% of the total energy available in the wood. So you're not losing a lot, losing 30% of your total energy yield, but 50% of the carbon atoms are retained in this biochar, which is a new structure that I'm going to talk about. What's amazing to me is we have a small amount of the biochar going back as a carbon release. This is called the labile carbon or the mobile matter. There is some sugars that are recycled back, but 20, 40 carbon atoms out of the 200 that the tree touched. 20% of every carbon atom that that tree ever interacted with can be put in the soil in a stable form. For a consultant, this would be the equivalent of, of packing away in your trust fund 20% of every revenue dollar you got that day. You got paid 1000 bucks today, you're going to put 200 bucks right away into your trust fund. It's a huge yield. It's not a tenth of a percent. So if this happens, we have a tremendous capture mechanism of stable carbon. I call this pyrolysis process, which is just burning, 
but it's burning in a manner that creates the biochar, an act of climate civil disobedience. Because you're intervening on behalf of the climate to make that carbon stable. And basically, the biochar, the carbon that you've put in the soil, is now going to take a carbon timeout. It's no longer going to be able to participate in that cycling back up to the atmosphere. So it's a great concept. Why does that happen? Well, has it, how long is it, you know, unlike Al Gore, who invented the internet, I didn't invent biochar. Mother Nature invented biochar 600 million years ago. And she invented it in the form of forest fires. As soon as the plants migrated out of the oceans, we started to have lightning strikes and excess biomass was burned. And one to two percent of those carbon atoms tend to get deposited as stabilized carbon. And that builds up. And when we look around the entire world, we see graphitic or stabilized carbon, and it's due to native fires. In addition, we see some anthropogenic carbon sources where practices have created excess large amounts of carbon. This is the terra preta. This is, in fact, the soils in the Midwest, the Iowa soils, which are due to the Indians repeatedly burning the grasslands off for hunting purposes. So man can do it. Mother Nature does it. It's not a foreign act. And how does it work? Well, basically, this is a plant at the chemical level. It consists mostly of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, three major components of all living plants. And so the plant as it grew wove these chemicals together. And what happens when we heat them to hot temperatures? Well, at 100 degrees C, it loses all its moisture. And then it goes through. And by the time it gets to 300 degrees C, which is when it turns black, it is completely transformed into a new structure, an entirely different structure, which was created by the plant in proximity, but chemically created by the heating process that consolidated it. Why does that happen? Well, to be perfectly honest, every living plant in the history of the world has never seen these temperatures before and lived to go on to propagate. So there's no reason that a plant would have to survive fire because it can't have offspring. So it doesn't develop that capability. So we're into a whole new world. And what ends up happening is, as you heat it up, little molecules, oxygen, water, acetic acid leave, called volatilization. Devolatilization is called the act of taking out the volatiles. And left behind is the carbon-rich carbonization matrix. And they have no choice but to link up with each other. They're the only game in town. And they start forming these large networks. And they look like soccer balls. And they're mostly six-membered rings. There's some fives and some sevens. And as this process continues, it makes a three-dimensional structure that is, for all intents and purposes, air. It is mostly voidage. And that's the key to biochar. I made a permanent structure that's mostly air. And when I put that in the soil, good things happen. And this is the things we see happening in the soil. And I'm giving a workshop where I get into explaining how each of these works from a physical structure. I tell people very clearly, biochar is a simple, understandable material. It has very predictable benefits in the soil, one of which is microbial interaction. And once you take life into the equation, you have a lot of diversity. But we know exactly what the biochar is going to do when we put it in the soil. We see improved moisture dynamics because there's a, the voidage gives a place for water to go. And we also see improved moisture retention in desiccating conditions. In most agricultural systems that aren't irrigated, the crop ends its growing cycle when you run out of water. You plant after the rainy season, you watch it die, and then you harvest. Improved NPK retention, that's actually due to the fact that it takes up a lot of humic acids, and they hold the ferment. And then the final one is the microbial synergism, which is terrific. So here's my takeaway. Every person in this room can go home and make biochar. You can do that climate civil disobedient act by taking any biodegradable biomass, thermally pyrolyzing it. You'll have to go to the web or go to the, dig out a device and put it in the backyard. Just start stranding that carbon in the soil and refuse to let it go back up. And basically, make biochars. 
It, you make biochar, not the other guy. And in the process, save your world. 